In this video, we are going to be looking at the coastal feature called a spit. So first of all, let's consider what type of GCSE exam questions we could be asked. So first things first, we could be asked the formation of a spit, so the step-by-step -step processes that go into how it is formed. We could be asked to annotate photographs or a diagram of a spit for a number of marks, or we could be asked an OS map skills question where we might have to use grid references or maybe label the features of a spit. I have also seen a great GCSE exam question on an AQA legacy spec paper where they give you an OS map and then next to it is a white version of that OS map with the grid squares on and they ask you to draw the shape of that spit. So let's get started then with looking at what a spit actually is. So a spit is created by deposition and it is effectively an extra stretch of beach which is made up of sediment such as sand, rock and pebbles that is transported out into the sea to form an extra stretch of land. So if we start first of all by looking at the formation of a spit. So step one is where we have a headland that at some point will be located very close to a river and we will have a stretch of beach as well. So we start off with the process of longshore drift from a prevailing wind, which is the strongest wind direction or the most dominant wind direction moving towards the beach. This causes the process of longshore drift to occur, whereby we have the process of swash, where the waves move up the beach, picking up material, and then we have backwash, where material is transported back into the sea. This process is created back and forth through swash and backwash, which forms the process of longshore drift, and this process transports sand and shingle further along the coastline towards the headland. Step two in the formation of a spit is when we start to see the direction of longshore drift continuing to transport that sediment, that extra stretch of beach material further around the headland due to the direction of longshore drift and this prevailing wind direction. Step three in the formation of the spit is when we then have the, the distal end or the end of the spit being exposed to a change in wind and wave direction from a secondary prevailing wind. What this causes is the end of the spit to become exposed and hook back towards the land forming a recurved end. Step four in the formation of a spit is when we then have a sheltered area behind the spit, that stretch of coastline that has been formed through the process of longshore drift, being protected from the waves of the sea or body of water. So therefore, lots of material accumulates or collects in this area, which means that plants are able to grow. And over time, the sheltered area can become known as a mud flat or a salt marsh. It is also very important to note here in this diagram that a spit never attaches to the opposite side of the river or the headland. A spit is only ever connected by one piece of land and that is the headland in which it first travels around. A famous UK example of a spit would be known as Sperm Point on the east coast of the UK or England to be more specific just south of the Holderness coastline. This stretch of coastline, as you can see on the screen, has been created through the process of longshore drift. And if we were to take a photograph, just like we could have given to us in a GCSE exam, we can actually begin to label various features of this spit. So we can highlight the lagoon behind the spit that is protecting the sea from traveling further inland, which is where our salt marsh or our mudflats can develop. We can see I have labeled the spit distal end or the end of the spit that is stretching out into the sea as well. So these are just some examples of what we could label on photographs to get those extra marks as well as the proximal end which is the end that connects the spit to the mainland. So if we then look at the same example on an OS map 
we might be asked a GCSE exam question that says, give the four figure grid reference of the distal end of this particular spit. Therefore, I would choose first of all to locate the distal end on my map by labeling it, which is the end of our spit, which sticks out into the C. I would then choose to draw a grid square and locate where my distal end is within that grid square. And then I would go along the corridor to find my number that matches my bottom left hand corner, which in this case is 39. And then I would go up the stairs to again find the number that connects to my bottom left hand corner, which in this case is number 10. So if we were to give a four figure grid reference for the distal end, it would be 3910 or 3910. Alternatively, a different question we could be asked could be to label the OAS map with features of the spit. So just like we did before on the photograph, now we are testing our knowledge of reading OAS maps. So we might choose, for example, to label the distal end. We might choose to label the lagoon, so that area behind the stretch of beach which has been created through longshore drift. We might also choose to label mud flats, salt marsh, the proximal end which attaches the spit to the mainland. So these are all just examples of what we could choose to label on an OS map if we were given this as a GCSE exam question.